Thank you. Thank you, Jamie, and praise team for that offering up to the Lord of your talents. Uh, it's exciting to again have Greg Hills back in the pulpit. Uh, Greg it goes all over the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast, uh, uh, speaking in churches all over our denomination. What a privilege to have had him this whole month, and next week he'll be closing our Missions Month series. And uh, Greg, just so happy to have you with us again this, this morning. Great. Thanks. Parents, if you're dismissing, oh. that's why I came up. There you go. Parents, if you're dismissing your children to Children's Church, they can be dismissed at this time. That's for children ages three through third grade they can go out the back doors, and they'll be coming back a little early for something special. Glad you didn't ask me to remember that, Dave. Well done. Yeah, it's great to be here this morning, and thanks to the Irwins for your testimony. Um, it's very powerful about the gospel in our marriages, and as you survey the missionaries in the back and you write notes to them, remember to pray for their marriages, because cross-cultural living adds an extra layer of pressure to marriages, So, be, you know, and they're not perfect just because they're missionaries, um, and so please be in prayer for them as well. Uh, but I want to ask you a question this morning. What gives you an adrenaline rush? Think about that. What? you like, yeah, you start to get excited about it. Uh, I grew up in a, a, an avid skiing family. And uh, my brother Jeff, my older brother Jeff, is an amazing skier. If you saw him, you'd be amazed. And I remember the first, we grew up in Syracuse, lots of snow, but nothing like the West. And I remember the first time he took me out to the West. I was one of the bulls, I think it was in Utah. And <clears throat> it was the first time in my life where as we're approaching the uh, edge of the slope, I, I we're kind of looking and trying to find where it is. It was steeper than anything. Those of you who are skiers know what I'm talking about. And my heart's starting to pound. And I'm not sure I'm going to make it. And my brother, he's very nonchalant. He's like, oh, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Just get into your rhythm. And, but it's steep, so don't fall. That's really good advice. So, because it's fast, right? And so I get out there and I make my first turn. As I go to my second turn, I went right over. And I'm headed straight, face first, down the hill. I'm gaining speed. My brother's laughing. And um, it was an adrenaline rush, for sure. Um, and he said to me after, why'd you do that? And I'm like, well, because I'm dumb. Anyway, what is it that gives you an adrenaline rush? Well, I, believe it or not, the Bible has a category for delighting in fear. Delighting in fear. It's a little bit shocking, delighting in fear. Um, it's like this adrenaline rush that leads to this deeper connection to the Lord and desire to serve in his kingdom. And we're going to be looking at this through uh, Nehemiah chapter 1. And Erica Weaver is going to read for us uh, the passage in just a few moments. Now, but I just want to set the context a little bit because Nehemiah, it's back in the Old Testament. Um, it's right in between our chapters, kind of in between Ezra and Nehemiah, the first chapter of it. And uh, it is right around 445 BC. Uh, Jerusalem had been destroyed by Babylon almost 140 years earlier, perhaps even 150 years earlier because of the disobedience of God's people. And you may know that he scattered his people abroad. But if you read later on, under the Persian king Cyrus, waves of exiles were allowed to come back to Jerusalem to begin to rebuild the city. Now, if you read in the book of Ezra, just before Nehemiah, you'll notice that they, they finally complete the temple. It's not quite as glorious as the first temple, but they complete it, which was no easy task. But between internal strife and external pressure, they were not able to rebuild the rest of the walls. The walls are still in ruins. And to us, that's not a big deal today. But in those days, the city wall was, that's how you were protected. That's, that was key to your prosperity as a city. So today we're going to look at Nehemiah's experience and we're going to look at his threefold response. And so Erica, if you don't, oh, there you are. Well then, if you could read Nehemiah chapter 1 for us. Nehemiah 1, 1 through 11. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Han and I, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jer Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the providence who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. 
As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you have commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there." They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who who delight to fear your name. And give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Amen. Thank you for the reading of the word. So here's Nehemiah. He's in uh, the city of Susa, and uh, he understands the importance of a wall because he's in the palace, right? He's 120 feet above everybody else looking down from the palace walls over the, the capital city of Persia at that time. And he's just wondering, and he's waiting for news from Jerusalem. And his brother Hanani brings him the news and immediately brings the news to Nehemiah. But it begs the question, why is Nehemiah so curious. I mean, what does it really matter? He's born in Persia 900 miles away. Take a look at the map here for a second. See where the city of Susa is? And you see that red line that goes over to Jerusalem? That's 900 miles. That's a three-month journey on camelback. I mean, most I complain, right, 10-hour flight, and I'm like, oh, my back and the food. And right, Imagine having to go three months to Jerusalem. So why does he care? He's never stepped foot in Jerusalem. He was born in Persia. And by the way, he's got a cushy job. I mean, potentially life-threatening being a taster for the king, but cushy nonetheless. What is going on? Well, the restoration of Jerusalem was predicted by uh, Daniel and Daniel's prayer. If you read in Daniel chapter 9 and 10, and what is Nehemiah doing? He is believing God at his word. See, God's desire becomes Nehemiah's desire. God's heart becomes Nehemiah's heart. But notice his first response because look what happens. He gets the news and it's not good news. He's hoping for something very different. And he's caught in this tension of of hearing this bad news and then he's weighing it against the promises of God. And I don't know if you've, you've experienced that. I'm sure you feel that tension, don't you? We feel that tension between we know there's progress of the gospel. We see God's kingdom advancing in other parts of the world. And yet we see a broken world around us. Take a look at this uh, map of the world. This is called the 1040 window. You may be familiar with it. And the red are the unreached people groups. We've talked about some of this in the last couple weeks. Those are people who do not have access to the gospel that's 10 degrees north of the equator to 40 degrees north of the equator from West Africa to East Asia. Those are unreached people groups. And then as it gets more green, those are more reached. But then I was talking to uh, one of our international directors of South America, and he said, you know, in certain parts of the world in the southern hemisphere, it's not the unreached, but the misreached. Those who are uh, drawn to a health and wealth gospel or a gospel of works. Um, But you you can sense the tension of, yeah, we have the promises of God. We know the gospel is advancing. But on the other hand, you don't have to look very far to see the brokenness of this world. So if you look at verse 3, what is his response? He sees what happens and immediately, I'm sorry, verse 4, he falls down and he weeps. He grieves. He hears the news and it breaks his heart. And this is not just because of the original fall of Jerusalem. That's, that's in a sense, ancient history now. That's what, that's what kids are learning in school. That was 150 years 
ago. Why is Nehemiah so upset? Well, what I hypothesize is that if you look in Ezra chapter 6, just a few chapters earlier, when the people are allowed to go back to Jerusalem and they're rebuilding the temple and they want to rebuild the walls, the people around them, are they don't want them to rebuild the walls because they think, well, they're just going to be a, a great power again. They're trying to keep... Uh, them from rebuilding the walls. So they write a letter to Artaxerxes, the same Artaxerxes that Nehemiah is serving under. Isn't that fascinating? It was about 15 years earlier. And so Artaxerxes, he's young in his reign. He says, okay, I got to take control. And he writes a letter back and says, you may not build the walls. And so they stop. And I think what's happening here is Nehemiah is hoping that 15 years later that somehow they would have been allowed to start rebuilding the walls. He's hoping for good news, but he grieves. He grieves over the state of God's people around the world. He grieves over the state of the church, if we were to put it in New Covenant terms. And he's not the only one who grieves over the state of the world, right? Jesus he wept over the brokenness of this world. Remember in uh, the story of Lazarus where Lazarus is dead, right? And, and he, he hears news that Lazarus is sick and dying and then he waits two more days, right? He kind of waits till he's dead. He knows what he's going to do. He's confronted by Lazarus' sisters. He's going up to the tomb. He knows what he's going to do. And what is his response? He's stirred in his heart and he weeps. Because he sees what sin has done to this world. The, the havoc that it's wreaked in this world. And you know also there's, there's a time when he's looking over Jerusalem. And he, he quotes, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I longed to, to gather you under my wings as a, as a hen gathers her chicks. But you would not. And he weeps over Jerusalem. And this is a challenge to me, and I hope it's a challenge to you, because I think to myself even, and this is my business of missions, like, when is the last time I was, I was that upset over the state of the world? Like, he's mourning, and he's grieving, and he's fasting, and he's praying over what has happened in Jerusalem. And, and if you're like me, I'm the same as everyone else here. You get, you get distracted, uh, you get disengaged. Uh, I don't know how many news feeds you have on your phone or on your computer, but you get so inundated with what's going on around the world that you almost become desensitized. Like, I just can't handle it anymore. And so would you consider praying, Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. Help me see the world as you see it. So his first response is he grieves. But notice what he does starting in verse 5. He doesn't stay in his grief. Grieving is appropriate. Lament. We have a whole book, Lamentations. Lamenting is appropriate, but we don't stay there. Look at what he does. Starting in verse 5. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant. See what he's doing? He's immediately coming from his grief and he starts to look up. And if, if, if this prayer in Nehemiah, as you heard Erica read it, almost follows, you know, the Acts, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, that pattern for prayer. Not quite. We'll look at it more closely. But I always tell people, like, if, if you're struggling in your prayer life, go to Nehemiah chapter 1 because it'll start to, start to revive your prayer life. But notice what he does. He, he adores God. He begins to praise him for who he is. He's not blaming God, although I've been there. He's not blaming God. He's saying that God is faithful. And there's something about even the praise team this morning, right? They start with adoration. Why? Because it lifts your head up. There's, if you're like me, you're just in the weeds in your life and you're just looking around and you can't see, right, the forest for the trees. And there's something about praise and adoration that begins to lift our eyes out of our circumstances. And it begins to help us see things from God's perspective and it takes the focus off me and it helps me to look up. What it does is it puts my heart in the right place to hear what is God trying to say to me through his word? What is he trying to say to me through the counsel of others? And it starts with adoration. But then notice what he does. See, there's this beautiful picture of 
I'm adoring God. I'm seeing his holiness. I'm seeing his goodness. But then I kind of look at myself and go, ah, guess what? I'm part of the problem. Right, remember, you've heard the quote maybe, uh, G.K. Chesterton, Chesterton, they asked him, you know, he's a great author, he says, you know, Chesterton, you know, what is wrong with this world? Do you remember his response? I am. See, Nehemiah knows it's not just everyone around him. He's not blaming everyone else. He begins in this time of confession. Now, he does it personal and corporate. Now, it's interesting because he's not a prophet. He's not a priest. He's not a pastor. He's not leading a congregation. But he's so compelled through his grief by what he's seen uh, that he is compelled to go before the Lord and fall on his knees and begin, in, during his time of fasting, begin to confess his sins in the context of what's going on in the wider people of God and what's going on in the world around him. But that's pretty common for us, right? Adoration, confession. But the third portion of his prayer is something, I don't know about you, but I don't do very often. He begins, look at verse 8. He starts with the word, remember. What's he doing there? He says, remember the words that you commanded your servant Moses. And he goes through this whole idea that, Lord, remember what you said to Moses. He begins to remind God of his own promises. And does that not seem weird to you? Has anyone ever reminded you of your promise? What is your normal reaction? Yeah, yeah, I already know. I know that. Thank you. But for some reason, God doesn't mind being reminded of his own promises. And basically what he's saying to the Lord here in this passage is, okay, Lord, you warned us, uh, we messed up, but there's hope. When we turn to you, there is hope, and you will fulfill your promises. God is faithful. He will always fulfill his promises. Reformer Martin Luther was praying for a friend one time. And this is what he says. This isn't a, just check this out. You may want to take a picture of this at some point. He says, I besought the Almighty with great vigor. I attacked him with his own weapons. Who prays like that? Well, only Martin Luther could pray like that, right? I attacked him with his own weapons. Quoting from the scriptures all the promises I could remember. That prayer should be granted. And said that he must grant my prayer if I was henceforth to put my faith in his promises. That's a man who took God's promises seriously. And we have, the, the, the scripture is replete with promises. They are all over from Genesis to Revelation. Let me just quote a couple of them for you. They're, they're not on the screen, but let me just quote a couple in, in terms of just missions alone. Genesis 12, he's talking to Abraham. You may be familiar with this passage. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And what? All the families of the earth shall be blessed. God has had the families of theirs. He's had the nations in mind from the very early stages of the book of Genesis. Isaiah 49, if you're in your church Bible reading plan, you just read this uh, uh, last week, or if, if you're behind like me, you just read it the other day. Uh, Isaiah 49, 6, I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may be reached, may reach to the ends of the earth. Isaiah is already talking about that. Right? I'm gonna, Israel's point was not just to worship the Lord and set up a nation. They were to be a light to the Gentiles. That was always part of God's plan. Matthew 24, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole earth, whole earth as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. Brothers and sisters, that is a promise. That is a promise that the gospel will go to all the nations. And with Nehemiah, it starts with prayer. It starts with prayer. Maybe some of you are familiar with Oswald Chambers. He wrote uh, My Utmost for his highest. It's a great devotional. If you're stuck in your devos, go to, go to you grab that one online. This is what he says about prayer. Check this out. Prayer does not fit us for the greater works. Prayer is the greater work. Let me say that again. Prayer does not fit us for the greater works. Prayer is 
the greater work. What he's saying is don't consider doing the work of the kingdom of God apart from prayer because you haven't done the work of the kingdom of God until you've prayed and bathed in prayer. Some of our missionaries, the Matlacks, Ken and Tammy, were, they had gone to Germany. This is many years ago. They had planted some churches and at one point and they were going to another location and they, they said we had, you know, we, had, we're, we had the theological training, we knew how to disciple, but they're in this part of uh, Berlin it was and they could not make progress. Facing all kinds of opposition, spiritual warfare, you know, personal issues coming up and they, just, they decided just to stop. All their efforts were falling on their faces and finally this is what they did. I think it was close to one year they decided they weren't going to do anything but pray for that town, that part of Berlin. And finally, after about a year, can you imagine that? A year, the Lord starts opening things up. And they were able to begin church planting again. That's the work of prayer. Prayer is the greater work. And I would challenge you uh, to go online uh, through the weekly news and start signing up for Friday and Saturday, that 24 hours of prayer. Uh, there's a lot of slots open right now, so you don't have to pray at 2 a.m. yet. So I would encourage you right after the service just to go and sign up for your favorite slot. I left these on the back. It's called Join the Story. They're on the table in the back. It's all the scriptures about missions. Uh, not all of them, but numerous ones about missions. If you're just wanting to pray and you want to start to pray through some of these scriptures for your missionaries. Nehemiah knew it. He grieves. So you notice the process, right? He sees it and it just, it just weighs heavy on his heart. But he doesn't stop there. He goes to the Lord in prayer. He knows that's the next part. And then he begins to what we would call supplication. He makes his ask. He's asking God, verse 11, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear in your name and give success to your servant today. He's, he's starting to pray. And grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now, who, well, who is this man? Well, if you've read Nehemiah before, you know. But then he ends it with this line. Look at what it says. Now, I was the cupbearer to the king. Now that's a, that's a, that's a mic drop, right? That's a, I'm done. I'm, right, I'm the, I was a servant of the king. He's the cupbearer to the king. I mean, what a line. What a LinkedIn profile, right? Like, yeah, you want to hire me? He has access, he has access to the most powerful man in the world at that time. So notice what he does. Notice what he does. He, he grieves. He prays, and thirdly, he commits. He's got something in mind when he says that. Lord, give success. What success is he talking about? We won't read Nehemiah chapter 2, but if you're familiar with it, in fact, take some time this afternoon and read it. It's amazing. He goes into the king, and he's forlorn. Why? Because he's been fasting and grieving. And in those days, you don't go into the king looking that way. That could cost you your life. And the king says, what's wrong? What's going on? And basically, Nehemiah explains how what's happened to his city in Jerusalem and the fact that things aren't going well. And, and so he says, well, what do you want? Now he's got the most powerful man in the world saying, so what do you want? And he says, I, I, it's like an arrow prayer. I prayed to the Lord and said, it's a great prayer. And he says, and, and he says I, I need to go to Jerusalem. And, and the king says, how long will you be gone? When will you return? Isn't that amazing? And then I said, then he goes on further. He says, if it pleases the king, let letters to be sent to the governors of the provinces. Oh, and by the way, can we go to the forest? And can I get all the lumber I need to rebuild? I'm trying to put this together. Like, okay, this is what he says. He says, king, I'm going to need extended paid time off. I'm going to need a diplomatic passport to get through this three-month journey. I'm going to need a ton of supplies and I'm going to need a boatload of cash. That's his ask. Isn't that amazing? And the king says, yes. That's a bold prayer. That's a bold prayer. That's a bold ask. And the Lord answers. Why? Because ne Liam, <laughs> Nehemiah, that's, that's the Celtic version. Nehemiah, 
he, he's locked and loaded. And notice what's happened. Listen to this quote. Nehemiah has prayed long enough and had faith enough to visualize the operation in some detail. Even to the building technique. This is all going on in his mind. Well, he's fasting and he's praying. And the Lord is just putting these things in his mind and in his heart. And this is what I love about it. Because he's not a prophet. He's not a priest. Who is Nehemiah? Well, we would call it a lay person in, in, in our terms today. Which is not a great term in my opinion. But that's the one we use. But what are his gifts? What are his gifts? He's not a preacher. He's not a teacher. He's a visionary. He's an organizer. He's an administrator. He's a galvanizer. And he's going to complete this task. Because God is going to complete his promises through his people. That's how he's doing this. He's doing it through Nehemiah. And somebody asked me a legit question last week, like, by the way, what do missionaries do? And we pray for them, but what do they actually do? Well, they do lots of things you do, what we do here, right? There are pastors who go and they, they preach and they teach. People do evangelism, they do discipleship, uh, they do training. And then there's everything else. If you were going to go from Cornerstone and plant another church, what would you do? You'd probably hire a pastor, you'd send him, and then you need everyone else around the church planter. So what do missionaries do? Well, they're accountants. They're medical professionals. They're engineers. That's how I was able to go into the Middle East. They're artists. I tell this, to, I ask people, what is the most desired technology in the world? You know what the most desired technology in the world is? English. English. If English is your mother tongue, you are eligible to go cross-culturally. And you can get into almost any country in the world. For better or for worse... English is the most desired technology in the world. Our Japan country leader, uh, before, uh, before he went back to uh, Japan, I was asking him, because, you know, I, I do mobilization. I'm trying to find people to go to different countries. And I said, I said, Craig, what do you need? What's, what's drawing Japanese people who are, we think we're busy? They're ten times busier than we are. What draws a Japanese person out of their house? He says, you know what's ha working right now most is um, cooking classes. We're offering American cooking classes. I'm like, what? Okay, so who here cooks and can, right, who here speaks English, right? Yeah, there you go. Who here knows how to cook and maybe could teach a few classes? I'm telling you, you need to sign up. We're sending you to Japan. That's the mission field, Right? What, what do you do here? That's what missionaries do. Except for one thing. Their lives are 100% on mission for what they're trying to accomplish. That's the difference. That's the difference. But you see the progression. He grieves. He prays. He commits. Let me ask you this. Would you commit to actively engaging in God's kingdom here and cross-culturally. Now why? Why does Nehemiah do this? What is his motivation? What gets him up in the morning? What gives him that adrenaline rush that allowed him to speak in front of the most powerful man in the world, risking his life? This is what it is. Again, verse 11. He's asking God to answer his prayer. The prayers of your servants who do what? Delight to fear in your name. That's his motivation. Delighting to fear in God's name. That is being so enamored with the person and work of God. And so enamored with the advancement of his kingdom. That it gives him an adrenaline rush. That's what motivates Nehemiah. And I think that's what ultimately. It's not guilt. I could guilt you all day long. It might get a few people overseas. No, it's the glory of God and the honor of his name. We're going to close with this. And I have some volunteers to help me. Yeah, come on in. And uh, maybe you've heard of William Carey. William Carey was often called the father of modern missions. It was in the late 1700s when he and his family left for India, which was unreached back then and still unreached today. Yeah, you guys can queue up over there. And this is a dialogue between William Carey. Hey, y'all. And if there's some fourth and fifth graders who want to come up and join us and maybe help me herd some cats here, that would be awesome as well. You're welcome to come up and just queue up here for a second. 
Now listen to this dialogue. You're going to see it on the screen between William Carey and some of the people who were sending him to India at that time. Our undertaking to India, this is a person kind of on the missions committee, so to speak, right? Our undertaking to India really appeared to me to be somewhat like a few men who were considering the importance of penetrating into a deep mine, which has never before been explored. So what they're doing, is they're, the analogy is going to a place where Jesus has never been mentioned or going to a place where the gospel is not there is like repelling into a dark, deep mine. We had no one to guide us, and while we were talking, William Carey said, well, I will go down if you will hold the rope. But before he went down, he took an oath from each one of us at the mouth of the pit to this effect, that while we lived, we should never let go of the rope. <clears throat> Sorry. Do you understand me? This was a great responsibility given to us who began this ministry. Do you see the importance? And Dan was talking about partnering, partnering with your missionaries. God will send some of us down into the mine and he's going to use the rest of us to hold the rope. And we need to be faithful, whether that's prayer, whether that's giving, and at the end we're going to talk about a couple of other things. This is what it means to be involved in advancing God's kingdom globally. Will you hold the rope? Well, we're going to try this, all right, with my volunteers because I thought it'd be kind of fun uh, to kind of solidify this in our mind. So I'm going to ask you guys to come up here. And musicians, if you're a little scared about your equipment, it's probably not an unfounded fear. Come on up, you guys. <laughs> and what we're going to do is I'm going to kind of stretch the rope. Now, you guys learned already in Children's Church, right, what's happening that shining your light for Jesus in a place where he's never been told is like going down into a deep, dark mine. So what happens if you go down into a deep, dark mine in a rope? What has to happen at the other end? Somebody's got to hold it, right? So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to toss. Yeah, can you just take the rope and just kind of toss it down the stairs for me? Oh, there, he's ready. Watch out. Okay. Whoa, yes. Okay, I can see who God is calling somewhere. All right. So this is what we're going to do. Half of you say right from defend the grove. Yes. Come on here and grab the rope. You grab, you're the anchor man, okay? You grab the rope. Keep grabbing the rope. Okay, you guys are going to grab the rope here by the stairs, okay? Like me? Yep, you too. Yes. And you guys are going to stay. And you too. Yes. Okay, this is what we're going to do. Up top, notice I'm staying up top. We're going to let them down into the mine, and they're going to shine their light for Jesus down into the pit. Are you guys ready? You know what we're doing? Okay, ready? Here we go. You guys start walking down. Keep walking down. Pull. No, that way, that way. You know, we're going down into, right, there we go. Yeah, there we see. Now we're holding. We don't want, right? And they're going down. They're going down. They're going down. You almost down there? Are you talking to people about Jesus? Yes. Yes. All right, so what is our job? I don't Hold the rope. Yeah. Yeah, okay, now, you guys, it's time to come home for a short time. We call that furlough, okay? What are we going to do? We're pulling you back up. And pull, whoa, okay, whoa, whoa, yeah. Hang on, hang on. Whoa, yes, you never know what's going to happen. And you guys, to don't let go of the rope. Hold the rope. All right, and here we are, and we made it. You guys all safe? Yeah. Did you tell a bunch of people about Jesus? Awesome. So you guys, listen, listen. Some of you all, God is going to call to go to a different country and talk about Jesus. And the rest of us who stay here are to do what? We pray for them. We help them on their way. We love them. And we, sh and we um, continue to support them on their journey. Okay? You got that? I'm sure you did. Okay, great. All right, I'm going to grab the rope. You guys, well done. Nice. That, yep, there we go. I'm sure that's not an expensive guitar. There we go. <laughs> Thanks for doing that. We will remember that, you guys. That's our job. That was just a fun way to say, okay, God may be calling some of you to go down, and he's calling all of us to hold the rope. 
for the last, our last um, slide here, just take a look because there's different ways. And next week, you're going to have a card in your chair, and we're going to ask you to consider filling this out. Because this is, some of us are going to be called to go down the shaft and the rest to hold the rope. I am interested in joining the missions committee. That's one way you hold the rope. I will consider a short-term trip in the next two years. There's nothing more effective than a short-term trip to expose you to what's going on around the world. You'll be headed down the mine shaft. Or I am interested in discerning God's call to long-term missions. Be in prayer this week. How is God calling me? to be involved in his global kingdom. Does he cause us to grieve first? Call us to pray for sure? And then finally commit to his kingdom. Pray with me, please. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the testimony of Nehemiah about your great power. And your great name being made known. Lord, help us to yeah, care about what you care about. Help us to not be so distracted by this world. We forget what we're here for. You have a church for your mission. And we are called to go down the mine or to hold the rope. Lord, help us to be faithful to what you have called us to. We pray all this in Christ's precious name. Amen.